In this video, I'll be reviewing the ASIN T3A soldering station. This iron claims to have a mind-blowing 200 watts of power, resulting in very fast heat times, getting up to temperature in only a matter of a couple of seconds. With this kind of power at hand, you're able to do some pretty stupid stuff such as solder copper water pipe fittings that would normally be soldered using an acetylene torch. And not that I'd recommend soldering heavy 2AWG cable to terminal lugs, but with this kind of power, anything is a breeze. But the T3A is not just limited to big jobs. It's also perfectly suited for small precision jobs, such as PCB assembly and soldering fiddly SMD components. Temperature accuracy is also very good. After calibrating my unit, the accuracy between the most commonly used temperatures at 300 to 400 degrees Celsius averaged out to be 1.3% accuracy. If you opt for the T245 handpiece, there is no hiding the fact the T3A took design inspiration from JBC. This gives you the option of using genuine JBC tips in your T3A if you're so inclined. The question on my mind is, how does the performance stack up against a genuine JBC station, which costs more than three times the price? Spoiler alert, it's amazing. For those of you who are wondering, I paid full retail price for my T3A station, and this video is not sponsored in any way by the manufacturer. There are multiple handpiece options for the T3A station. I opted for the T245 handpiece, which gives you the option of running JBC tips. My kit also included three iron tips, with the option to purchase additional tips if needed. The lead insulation is silicone, which means the iron shouldn't be able to melt through the cable. Compared to a genuine JBC cable, this feels slightly less flexible, however it's quite adequate for the job at hand. The handle does lack a soft foam boot, typically found on this type of handpiece, which is a real heartbreaker if you're a highly successful hand model as myself. However, the good news is foam boots can be easily bought online for a couple of dollars. There are several handpiece holder options to choose from. I chose this style of holder since it allowed use of the temperature setback function when the handpiece is placed in the holder. They also borrowed JBC's holder design, along with JBC's hot swap tool changer, which allows for easy tool changes even when the iron is thermal nuclear hot. The stand also features a brass wool holder with a silicon splash cover. At the back we have a cable which is used for the temperature setback feature. Moving on to unboxing the station, the body is constructed from brushed alloy. At the front we have a decently sized colour LCD screen, rotary encoder, menu buttons and a port for the handpiece. On the side there is a USB Type-C port for firmware upgrades and at the back we have a power input socket, power switch, port 1 is used for the tool holder, then a spare earth port. And lastly, a 24 volt DC power output, which can be used to run accessories such as an extractor fan and so on. With the unboxing taken care of, I can now connect all the components together. With the power on, we're greeted with a delightfully annoying buzzer tone with every user input. Fortunately, the buzzer can be turned off in the menu. Out of the box, my unit was set to Chinese, however, since the menu utilises icons, it was easy enough to figure out how to change the language to English. The menu system has quite a few options. 
You can calibrate the temperature, however I won't be exploring that option yet. First I'd like to establish the performance out of the box. The rest of the menus include just about every option you'd hope to see on a soldering station, along with three customizable temperature presets. With the iron at room temperature, it takes only a couple of seconds to heat up. Assuming the temperature readout is accurately tracking the tip temperature, this thing easily competes with the genuine JBC for heat up time. Next I pulled out my Heiko polygraph meter to measure the temperature accuracy. With the temp set to 300C, it was about 12 degrees hotter than advertised. At 350C, there was quite a noticeable overshoot blasting up to 388C. However, the temp stabilised back down to 360C. Lastly, with the temp set at 400C, there was again an overshoot, followed by a stable temperature of 427C. One thing that became evident during testing was the handpiece was getting uncomfortably warm after a few minutes of use. Unlike the genuine JBC, the handpiece is missing a foam boot. Fortunately, this problem is easily fixed and only costs a couple of dollars. I'll leave a purchasing link to this foam boot in the description if you're interested. For an apples to apples comparison, I ran the same set of tests at 300, 350 and 400 degrees C on my genuine JBC. And if you're like me, I was surprised to learn the T3A has very similar temperature accuracy when compared to my also uncalibrated JBC. No complaints here, especially considering the price to performance ratio thus far, but let's not be too quick to draw any conclusions. Since we saw some temperature overshoot, I wanted to run another set of tests, starting off with the JBC setting the bar. With the iron set at 350C, I then introduced the dreaded wet sponge feared by all irons. From this test, there was no appreciable overshoot measured. Bravo JBC! Sure, the temperature is 10 degrees hotter, but we're measuring overshoot, not accuracy here. Now it's time for the T3A. This had some spicy overshoot, reaching just over a 50 degrees C overshoot. Round 2 resulted in a more modest overshoot. Now so far we've collected good data on how both these irons perform with regards to temperature. But one thing we can't test for with this is how much heat either of these irons can dump into your workpiece. For that we're going to need something with a bit of thermal mass behind it. Which is why I've gone for this length of copper tubing. It's 15mm in diameter and for these soldering irons this is quite a lot of metal to try and heat up at one time. It's going to be a stress test for both of these irons to see if they can combat how much heat this copper tubing can pull away from the soldering iron tip. So let me give you a rundown of how this test is going to work. Starting off the tube will be at room temperature and we'll have the meter monitoring this end of the pipe. At the other end of the pipe the soldering iron will be applied to the end with a little bit of solder and the test will run for 60 seconds. Now at the end of 60 seconds I'll remove the soldering iron and we will note down the temperature at this end of the tube. Now because this is quite uh, a lot of metal to heat, it's got a, a sort of heat sink property where it's going to suck a lot of heat out of this iron. So the more heat or more power 
the soldering iron can dump into the workpiece, the hotter the temperature at this end will be. So in other words, the iron that has the hottest temperature at the end of 60 seconds would have put the most heat into the workpiece, therefore being the more powerful iron. Now not only will we get that metric, but we'll also be able to monitor the power meter uh, on the soldering iron itself. Now, just how accurate that is, I couldn't say. That's another test in itself, but at least it should give us some idea. To establish a baseline for this test, I wanted to start off with an older style iron. Before the time of modern direct heat iron tips such as my JBC or the T3A, these irons were the bee's knees. However, this style of iron has much slower response time when compared to more modern irons. After 60 seconds, the temperature recorded is 35C. You'll notice the temperature still climbs for a few seconds after the iron is removed. This is due to the residual heat travelling down the tube. For this test, I'll be noting down the temperature at exactly 60 seconds as opposed to the peak temperature. Next I pulled out my Miniware TS80P. This is a brilliant iron and is actually my most used iron in the workshop. Being a USB powered iron rated at 30 watts, it's definitely going to struggle in this test. Just barely been able to melt the solder around the tip. Still, the data gathered will be useful to evaluate against other irons. After 60 seconds, the temperature recorded is 37C. Next is the JBC. This is where the JBC flexes all over the previous irons, barely using 50% of its maximum power output and maintaining a toasty 350 degrees C and easily melting the solder on the copper tube. Lastly is the T3A. I used the same genuine JBC iron tip for this test to keep a level playing field against the JBC station. The T3A had no problem melting the solder on the tube, and if the power meter is accurate, the station is only using around 30-40% to 40 of its maximum power output. Much to my surprise, at the end of 60 seconds, the T3A managed to actually beat the JBC coming in at 55C. But to be fair, neither iron was using all of its maximum power output during this test, which is pretty crazy considering we're soldering copper water pipe here. With those tests done, the last thing I wanted to do was calibrate the T3A to try and improve accuracy. To do this, I need to measure the tip temperature at several points between 100 to 500 degrees C. After taking a temperature reading at each value, I wrote down the measured temperature and rinsed and repeated. Now I'm left with a table of values I can use to calibrate the station. Now all I had to do was enter the table of values and press the CH button to save. One thing worth mentioning that confused me at first, whenever I would go back to the calibration menu, none of my values were displayed. At first I thought the station was not saving my programmed values. However, I can confirm the data is indeed saved. I believe the reason for this is the station has not been configured to recall your saved data when revisiting the calibration menu, therefore it displays the default values instead. After calibrating, I repeated the same test and made a new table of values for comparison. And here are the results. Pre-calibration we had an overall score of average accuracy of 10%. Post calibration the average accuracy was improved to 5.1%. And if I draw your attention to the most frequently used temperature range of between 300 to 400 C, then accuracy was down to between 1 to 1.7%. Very impressive, especially for the price point. To update the firmware I went to jcprogrammer.com and clicked on the download center. 
I then scroll down to find the platform installation package. After downloading and clicking install, Windows gave me a warning since the publisher is unknown. After installation, most of the program is in Chinese. The first box that popped up was asking me if I wanted to update to the latest version. After the software finished updating, I navigated through the menu to change the language. Before connecting the iron, I installed their serial COM port drivers. Now I could connect the station using a USB cable. After a few seconds, the software automatically detected my station and proceeded to download and install the latest firmware on it. Once complete, you can unplug the station and you can then check the firmware version by navigating to the system info menu. To summarise, this soldering station offers incredible performance, out of the box the temperature accuracy is pretty decent, and after calibrating the accuracy was quite impressive. During testing we did see some temperature overshoots, however the wet sponge test is pretty brutal compared to normal everyday use. Really, if you're in the market for an iron upgrade, I haven't tested anything else that offers similar performance in this price bracket, so really, it's a no-brainer. So that about wraps it up for the review of the T3A. What an impressive soldering station, especially at this price point. I'm really blown away by it. Um, if you're thinking about picking one of these up, it'd be awesome if you can use that affiliate link down in the video's description because it gives me a small kickback at no cost to you and helps fund more future videos like this. So believe me, buying products and filming and editing takes quite a bit of time and money to do, so that would be much appreciated. Of course, thank you to my Patreon supporters for their continued support as well. Thanks for liking, commenting, and getting me to 100,000 subscribers. That is awesome. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.